right, we're on Matthew chapter 22, which deals with a number of subjects, not the least of which is what happens if you don't follow through on the Christian life and don't live up to the responsibility God has given you. We're looking at Matthew 22, 3 to 6, talking about a wedding banquet where a kingdom on earth, a king, has invited everybody for attending a wedding banquet in the marriage of his son to his bride. This wedding banquet is not the entire kingdom, but it, it's a parable about it, and it's a very important and unique part of that kingdom. So the king's invitation is about the kingdom of heaven. The king's invitation is rejected in the parable. Matthew 22, 3 to 6. He sent his servants, the king, to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my wedding. My oxen, my oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention, and they went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and even killed them. What could this be? Let's examine. Servants. Slaves, douloi, a term in the context of Matthew 22, which has the reference to faithful servants of the king as well as believers and followers of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. You look at 1 Corinthians 7.22, this is corroborating it. For he was a slave when he was called by the Lord, is the Lord's freed man. Similarly, he was a free man when he was called as Christ's slave. Three groups of the king's servants are rejected. The three groups of slaves may represent the prophets and John the Baptist as the first group, verse 3, for they were certainly rejected to the extent of being tortured and killed. Now this is pre predominantly by Israel, the Jews. Verse 4 may represent the disciples who were at first sent out to Israel only, and then later in the period of the book of Acts, after our Lord's crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, the disciples regrouped and received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And then they went out again. At first, they went almost exclusively to the house of Israel again, with the message which still preached of the kingdom of God through faith in Christ the Messiah. When they say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, it's at hand in, in the sense that if all Israel believed in Christ, then they would start the kingdom right then and there. But it was not to be. It was primarily through the Apostle Paul that the gospel of salvation was later spread to all nations. That was the responsibility of Israel, but they neglected it. Most were not even believers. So the disciples were commanded to spread the gospel to all nations. And later on this would happen, but first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. This second group of disciples, which were of Christ's servants, were paid no attention to by most of those to whom they gave the gospel just as the parable teaches. But the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The Jewish leaders, likewise, in the first century, mistreated the disciples and killed them as prophesied by our Lord. Matthew 23, 34. This prophecy was fulfilled as noted in many places in Scripture. Immediately after this rejection by the Jews of the invitation of the kingdom of God through faith in Christ the Messiah, of the second group of disciples came the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of Titus, Roman Empire, in A.D. 70. So God predicted, unless they turned back to him, they would get this disastrous happening, and it did happen in A.D. 70. The king takes revenge. So in Matthew 22, 7, the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. There you go, A.D. 70. Compare Luke 19, 41 to 44. As, and when he approached, Jesus approached, he saw the city of Jerusalem and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you the things which make for peace, but now they have hidden, been hidden from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side. Exactly what happened in A.D. 70 and will level you, level you to the ground, and your children within you. And they will not leave you, 
and they will not leave in you, you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. That was the time when the Jews had an opportunity to believe in Christ. They turned on him, crucified him, and killed their disciple, his disciples. Now the third group of servants may well be representative of the disciples of Christ who have gone out after A.D. 70 when Jerusalem had been destroyed and continue to go out all over the world to Jews. That's us. The Jews are now largely dispersed all over the world and Gentiles alike to, to preach the gospel of salvation by grace through faith alone in the Messiah Jesus Christ alone. Now we get into the sticky part. Be careful. One must be worthy enough to attend the banquet. Then he said in Matthew 22, 8, he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those who had been invited were not worthy. Israel, but those who had been invited were not worthy. Worthy, meaning deserving. The parable keeps the banquet within the kingdom in view. The parable is consistent, and we are to glean from it what Jesus meant by it. So it is stating that those who have rejected the invitation to come to the son's banquet are not worthy to attend. Those who did not believe weren't worthy even to get into the millennial kingdom, never mind the banquet within it. Those who were not were believers were not worthy to attend either if they hadn't been faithful. So just as those who do not accept the invitation to trust alone in Christ alone are, in the absence of any righteousness, unworthy to attend our Lord's wedding banquet or get into the kingdom, they do not even get into the kingdom of heaven, much less are they deemed worthy to attend the wedding banquet itself. This being a parable, and parables generally being straightforward illustrations of biblical truths, we must consider the most straightforward meaning of the word unworthy here, that of those first invited being unworthy relative to their own merits. Since salvation is never a meritorious condition on the part of the believer, then attendance at the wedding banquet of our Lord does not have the subject of salvation in view. Furthermore, those who do not accept the invitation to trust alone in Christ alone never permit themselves the opportunity to perform a single faithful deed for the Lord, so they can't even do one worthy deed until they become believers. Romans 8, 6 to 8. For the mind set on the flesh, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So in step 6.6, 6, the invitation is extended not only to Israel, but to all who will come. So 22.8 to 9, Then he said to the servants, the king, to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those who had been invited were not worthy. So he tells the servants, Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. Does that sound like the universal gospel throughout the world? Yes. To the street corners, to the major intersections of internationally traveled roads, and to the rest of the world, to Jews and Gentiles. And he commands the servants, and invite to the banquet anyone you find, and preach the gospel of salvation to anyone who will listen. Preach the message which invites anyone into the kingdom of God by faith, Jews and Gentiles alike. So go therefore, Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we have that corroborating. Point seven, the banquet hall is filled with all kinds of people who have accepted the invitation. So the servants went out into the streets, Matthew 22, 10, and they gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests, gathered all the people they could find, who accepted the king's extended and universal invitation. Those who gain entrance into the banquet are those who have accepted the invitation to trust alone in Christ alone as Savior, but to remain in the banquet is another matter. There's no merit in getting invited into the kingdom, but you have to have some merit, if not a lot, to remain in the banquet within the kingdom. Some of the guests will be good. Matthew 22:10 continues. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Both good and bad. Interesting, but both good, those who accepted the invitation and became eternally secure believers, and 
who remained in fellowship with God, performing divine good works. They remained in there. They had some merit in their Christian lives. And some of the guests will be bad. And bad, evil. Those who accepted the invitation to the kingdom by faith alone in Christ alone, and also became believers. But they did not remain in fellowship with God. And so they lived as carnal Christians. They lived evil lives. Christians can do that. They're out of fellowship with God and involved with worldly interests. We have a number of passages here to look at that. There, these are the believers who accepted the invitation of the wedding banquet and who arrived at it, but who continue to live evil lives and will be thrown out of that banquet. They will be thrown out of that banquet when their rebellious lifestyle is revealed. 2 Corinthians 5.10 indicates that there will be those evil believers who do evil. Second Corinthians 5.10 A lot of motorcycles out here lately. For we believers must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, in the temporal body, the believer. Believers are in view here, whether good or bad. So believers can be good or bad, one time or the other. Or the corrupt, worthless, depraved, or evil. It's not unfounded that a believer who's been trusted, uh, declared righteous by God for eternal life can still do evil. Not all who attend the banquet, therefore, will be acceptable. And all invited to the banquet are those who are believers. And, uh, and nobody else. Only believers, Jew and Gentile. So Matthew 22, 11 to 12. But when the king came in to view the guests, he looked intently at a man there who had, had no on no wedding garment. Now in an ancient wedding, you arrived in your street clothes. You were given a wedding garment, a whole outfit to wear at the wedding. Your, your dirty street clothes are set to the side and every invited guest has a wedding garment to put on. And so the king said, friend, notice friend, not enemy, not unbeliever. Friend, how did you come in here without putting on the appropriate wedding garment? And, and the, the friend, the believer who was unfaithful, and he was speechless. Now, traditionally, we're going back into this, in the Middle Eastern part of the world, guests at an event such as this are often provided with some sort of appropriate clothing to wear. And this would be an important factor to consider here since these particular guests were invited to attend right from where they were encountered out of the, in the street corners and intersections and without any advance notice so that one could be prepared. So anyone not wearing appropriate dress refused to put on the wedding clothing that was provided by the king. So on the one hand, it becomes an attitude problem, one of being unfaithful to accepted customs of social behavior. That's offering the king in the parable offending the king in the parable. And on the other hand, it becomes an attitude problem, one of being unfaithful to God's command to the believer to obey his commandments, thus offending the king of kings, Jesus Christ. This, the immediate hearers of our Lord's words would have clearly understood this message, even without further revelation as found in the New Testament. We're not that acquainted with old time ancient customs. I've never gone to a wedding where I was given a suit to wear, but there they did that then. The king is there to visit, not to judge. So we look at 22, 11 to 12 again. He's noticing his friend, he's, he's not there to judge. He's, he's there to visit. Friend, how did you come in here without putting on the appropriate wedding garment? But all of a sudden he noticed he's not even wearing the appropriate wedding garment that he provided for him. Notice that the king is inside his kingdom. And then he comes into the wedding banquet itself in order to visit with, to meet with the guests, to visit with. The king's guests have been invited from all corners of the world, from all peoples, and all, as all are invited to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. The king's guests are guests. They have accepted the wedding invitation and are inside at the wedding supper in the kingdom. As all who have accepted the invitation to believe in the gospel of salvation, they do gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. They're not excluded. 
because it's faith alone that gave them that entrance. And they gain entrance 